So according to Jacobin Magazine, uh, they claim that uh, Representative Mark Wayne Mullen of Oklahoma, uh, he, he and his wife, I guess, are, are big into real estate there in Oklahoma, uh, got a bunch of, real, a bunch of rental properties. Uh, it's being alleged by Jacobin that uh, uh, they're putting, booting people to the curb. Uh, they have filed eviction notices for what they say, quote, are non-payment of rent fees or other charges and non-payment of rent fees and other charges. Uh, they're basically booting people out of their out of their rental units during a time of pandemic when there is an order in place, uh, a moratorium on evictions. And this is one of those moments where you go, um, now, understand, uh, Mark Wayne, uh, you know, you know, He's not Bruce Wayne. Uh, he's willing to boot people out during a pandemic. And this is another example of, you know, it's tough to be poor in America. Uh, not only is it tough to be poor, it's really freaking expensive. Uh, because here's the thing. Sadly, these folks don't have the money to defend themselves. If they had the money, they'd have paid the rent. And also, sadly, they don't have the, the knowledge to know that they can fight it. So we're going to end up with people living on the streets. And that is... That is unconscionable, especially coming from a sitting U.S. congressman who should know better. Uh, but that's why I've asked uh, Colleen Sadix to come talk with us. She's the author of Broke in America, Seeing, Understanding, and Ending U.S. Poverty. Colleen, thanks for taking time for us. Hey, it's my pleasure. So you you basically wrote the autobiography of my life. I'm, I'm usually broke in America. Uh, but sadly, uh, you know, I guess fortunately for me, not as bad as, as a lot of folks, especially yeah. people being booted to the curb by uh, by our friend here, Mark Wayne. Yeah, it's disgusting. Um, made all the more disgusting when the, when you consider that during the pandemic, the wealth of billionaires in this country cumulatively has increased one point one trillion dollars. So the mess we're in now is really just exacerbating the mess that we've always been in, that there's a tremendous inequality in this country. We know that even before the pandemic, 40% of us couldn't meet our basic needs for things like shelter and food. And that's ridiculous and unnecessary. No, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I, I, I go back to the, to Mark Wayne there, uh, uh, you know, basically flouting the law, figuring that people aren't going to know it. Uh, part of the problem is we've set up all of these programs and all this policy that you have to know exist and then know how to navigate, uh, which sadly, you know, most people don't have the time or the the ability to navigate. And that's exactly why they set them up like that so that you yeah. don't get through these systems. Yeah. I mean, you talk to legal aid lawyers and they're heroes, but they'll spend hours and hours and days and months getting people what is only rightfully theirs, which is why in the book we really, we look at hardcore bread and butter pay issues. Americans wouldn't be in this vulnerable state if we all made a living wage. And, you know, I'm going to quote a bunch of stats I'm sure that you know, since the 1970s, we've been losing ground as workers. Wages have gone up for the average worker 12%, while they've gone up for CEOs more than 900%. And that's a period where healthcare costs went up 103%. So obviously we're falling behind. You know, we are, we're told this story that the way to get ahead is to work hard. You know, my co-author and I, Joanne Goldblum, we interviewed hundreds of people living in poverty for this book. Most of them work harder than Joanne and I do but it's just not enough. So they're working two and three jobs because they're just not making real wages. Yep. No, I say this every time there's a new president and you know, I, I wished it for, for every president that I've been on the air. I want you to be the guy who returns reward to work. I want mm -hmm. to, I want to re uh, reinvigorate or, or breathe life into that thing that I grew up believing as a kid, that if you worked hard, you played by the rules, you got ahead. Uh, sadly, yeah. that's not reality. Cause as you've uh, so accurately pointed out, uh, there are a lot of people working really, really hard, two and three jobs. And, you know, like a hamster on the wheel, they never get ahead. And, and that's a serious problem. And for me as a union guy, uh, it comes back to we need to expand people's ability to join and form unions and to collectively bargain. But be, we need to go beyond that. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of ideas that, that we, we should be pursuing. And I'm hoping the Biden administration is going to do some of that. 
Well, I, I see some hope in what they're doing. Um, you know, naturally, I want more. A $15 an hour minimum wage by 2025 is certainly better than anything else anyone has offered. I would argue that $15 an hour minimum wage right now is not enough for most people to meet their needs. Um, I would certainly like to see Medicare for all. But my great hope with the Biden administration is not Biden or anyone else in the administration per se. It's the fact that we have a functioning government now. There's and a that start. <laughs> people like you and me can exert power on our government and say, this is not acceptable. This is not sustainable. We need to end poverty in the United States. We can. Well, we most certainly can. We're the richest nation in the history of civilization at its wealthiest point, as you pointed out a minute ago. Our heavy 600, the 600 billionaires that we created through lower wages and lower opportunities, uh, they they wildly profited from this pandemic while millions of people have lost their jobs, their savings, their health care, uh, their, their future. And they're probably never going to get that stuff back. But at least at least our billionaires are well taken care of. That's something we can take solace in, no? Yeah, good to know. And the other thing about poverty in America is that once you get kicked into it, it's really hard to get kicked out. You know, you mentioned all those people that Mark Wayne is evicting. Once you've been evicted, it's really hard to get someone to rent to you again. Once you've fallen behind in a utility bill, it's hard to get utilities again. And if you can't get utilities, you can't get a place to live. It, it goes on and on. The recovery is just amazing. In my state, um, if you have received public benefits, we have something called a welfare lien. And if you should happen to inherit a couple of thousand bucks or win the lottery or whatever, and you receive benefits at some point in the past, the state will come take it. That's insane. And, and, and I know that you know, the state of Pennsylvania wanted to do that, and they may have under my nose without us knowing it. But, you know, what infuriates me about that is we're going to go after somebody who, who's at the bottom who may have gotten a little bit of something. Right. But we never seem to focus on those people at the, at the top who are taking everything. And, well, I guess it's because we don't see them every day, isn't it? Right. Um, you know, we're really segregated. We are segregated racially. We're segregated economically. So we don't see people. Um, so that was Joanne and I's work was to go and see people. Um, and one thing you talked about, about hard work and gain ahead. Um, one of the most heart wrenching places I went was a little town called Lytle, Texas, very poor ag agricultural area. Um, lovely people who were really trying to help their neighbors, but who just didn't have that much to help with. I met this one young man who was an outstanding student, an athlete, working almost full time to contribute to his family, his large family. Um, he'd gotten a full ride to a university and he wasn't going. And the reason that he wasn't going was because his father was being audited. His father was a waiter. I mean, his father yes. was not sacking away millions. Um, and because of that audit, his financial aid got a hold on it and he couldn't do it without that. Now, the rest of the story is the Trump administration specifically targeted um, South Texas, predominantly Hispanic areas for tax audits. So that kid did everything right. That kid was Horatio Alger. He was so smart and polite and lovely. And it didn't matter. Yeah. No, it's it's crazy. And, you know, we, we hear these stories time and time again. Uh, and look, you know, the Trump administration, much like the Bush administration as well, they stopped going after the rich people with their audits and focused solely on people who didn't have the means to fight back like a waiter. Why are yeah. you in, why are you auditing a waiter? How much could he possibly have cheated you out of a couple of pennies? Uh, well, I mean, that's actually that's so common, though, in all these programs where we try and catch poor people gain away with something. Yep. Inevitably, if you go after food stamp fraud or something like that, 
the investigative cost is going to outweigh anything you get because there just aren't that many people doing it. Yeah, because they're using the food stamps they're using to to actually buy food with. Uh, you listen to the Rick Smith Show here with Colleen Saddix. Her book, Broke in America, Seeing, Understanding, and Ending U.S. Poverty. We'll make sure we get links out so you can take a look at this. You know, you brought up, you know, the fact that, you know, People are going to be homeless out of this stuff. And yes. my my mindset has always been we can solve we can solve any problem. But homelessness being one of those that we could easily solve. Uh, we could easily give people homes and they could live in those homes. And my my idea has always been we we chuck the idea of of a philanthropy incorporated. We get rid of the entire charity organization, all of the, the business that is uh, taking advantage of poor people. And we use that money that we give them in tax breaks to actually fund this stuff so that people don't have to beg for charity. They can actually just own their own home and, and take some pride in that. I mean, it's like a lot of things. I think we should be ending a lot of social programs, a lot of the handout programs, and have jobs programs. I, I think we should have the government be the, the employer of last resort. Uh, if the private sector can't or won't create enough jobs, the public sector should have to so that we don't have to beg. Your labor gets you what you need, and you can survive, and you can live and thrive a decent life. I'm curious your thought. Well, you know, homelessness is a really interesting problem to start with because the assumption is that the homeless person needs to be fixed. The homeless person needs no, they need a home mental health training or drug. You know, there's something wrong with this guy or why would he be sleeping on the street? Overwhelmingly, the people who are sleeping on the street are sleeping on the street because they can't afford rent. Yep, they're broke. I mean, you notice the guy who's talking to himself more, but you pass homeless people on the street every day and you don't even know it. Yep. Homelessness is a math problem. Everything is a math problem in this country. And I'm not saying that there aren't other forms of oppression. I'm not saying that we don't have to do something about sexism and racism. But if we started with giving people a fair wage and making sure that those people who couldn't work for whatever reason got benefits that actually sustained them, we could eliminate poverty. We, and we could, we could spend hard. our dollars more efficiently. And this is my problem with the whole Charity Incorporated. Uh, we got a bunch of people who fund a lot of things because it makes them feel good about themselves. And it's really not about the cause. Um, and, and that's what's, you know, as someone who grew up in poverty, grew up in a housing project, um, you know, I, I, I lived a lot of this stuff. So, you know, in talking about how we deal with poverty, I have some ideas. I don't have all of them, not like you have written a fantastic book, but I think what we're doing ain't working. No, it's not. It's, it's clearly not. Um, and I will say, like, I think a lot of nonprofits are really well-intentioned and some of them are doing great stuff sure yeah but um the stuff that tends to attract funding i think is the least efficient stuff um it, you know funders want something that is new and innovative giving people houses isn't new and innovative feeding people isn't new and innovative but if you don't meet people's basic needs how are they ever supposed to get up you know, poverty is a kind of a quicksand. If it, I remember interviewing one woman who ran a jobs program, she um, trained women who were on public assistance to work in manufacturing. So, you know, good, solid jobs, lots of demand, fair wage. Um, they tended to stop attending the program during the winter because they didn't have heat in their apartments and they all got sick. Now the job training was great, but it had to come, it had to come with some sort of support that would make them actually able to take advantage of it. And yeah. I think that's where we miss out very often. No, and then they also train they also train them, as you point out in the book, for for low wage jobs. I mean, you know, the lowest of the low wage jobs to where they're, you know, they're never gonna get ahead. Because, you know, I steal a line from Ronald Reagan because I agree with with the sentiment that Reagan, not a big fan of Ronald Reagan. I agree with the sentiment. You know, the best anti-poverty program is a job. I've amended that. Uh, the best anti-poverty program is a union job uh, with mm -hmm. superior wages, good health care and, and uh, some retirement security. Uh, if we could get that for every working person, we'd be well down the road to make sure that that we have poverty whipped. 
Well, of course, you know, the the whole 1970s on period that I'm talking about where people lost real wages, that coincides exactly with the period where fewer and fewer workers were represented by a union. Again, that's we policy. That right now, you know, the, the boss has the power, the worker doesn't. That's why, you know, um, we talked with CNAs who during the pandemic were working in multiple nursing homes. It was a really dangerous thing to do for public health. And they did that because they had to feed their children and the wage they got wouldn't feed their children. That's ridiculous. And that's bad for all of us. No, it is crazy. But, you know, I, I have my religious friends who like to remind me uh, that, you know, they, they always quote Matthew 26, that, you know, the, the poor are always going to always going to be with you or something like that. We, you know, we, we need evidently we need the poor because it's been ordained by God and it keeps us on the hamster wheel. So we keep showing up to those jobs. Um, how do you break that kind of thinking that, well, you know what? We're always going to have them, Colleen. We're always going to have poor people. That's just it's the way things are. The cream rises to the top. Yeah, well, not really. A lot of times the cream gets whipped. Um, when Jesus said that, by the way, he was speaking to Judas, who was somebody he knew was going to die soon. So the poor would always be with Judas, but not with you and me. That's a choice. And the way I think we break that down is to show people that people aren't in poverty because they are lacking in knowledge or ambition or character. They're in poverty because most people really struggle to make a decent wage and support their families. You know, what I talked about, wages go down, 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 expenses go up, up, up. That creates poverty. It's not a personal failing, but you know, we very frequently saw that even when we were talking with people whose job was to serve people in poverty, they would have very dismissive things to say about them. They were very distrustful of them a lot of times, not everybody, but but some people, there is this assumption that, yeah, well, you know, they want to take it easy. Being poor is not pleasant. No, 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 no. And no, I, I tell this story all the time. And, you know, I, I was eight years old and I'm, I'm older now, uh, but it's with me like it happened yesterday. We were on food stamps and I had to take this clown money to the to the local store. And the woman yeah. behind the counter just made the biggest deal about buying a Nutter Butter bar that, that I shouldn't be able to buy this. That's that's not something you people should have. And it was yeah. it was this horrible uh, you know, degrading, humiliating, angering moment in my life that if if I knew where they buried her, I would go dig her up so I could kill her again. That's the kind of that's the kind of visceral react. And even to this day, I'm I'm still ticked about it. No one should have to go through that indignity just so they can eat. Uh, not in the wealthiest country in the history of civilization. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember interviewing one man for the book who kept telling me, I'm a good person. I really am. Of course you are. Why would I suspect otherwise? At one point in my life, I ran a soup kitchen um, and I had a particular relative who used to always say to me, do you think they really need it? And I would always say, no, I think they come for the ambiance of standing in line in a basement to eat off a metal tray. Yeah, hold, 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 let me stop you right there. Um, how, how come I never hear that question? Because I've heard that too. Um, how come we never hear that about Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos? Yeah. Jeff Bezos makes more than $2,500 a second. I don't think he really needs it. No, I think we could use that much better by, oh, I don't know, taking that and giving people somewhere to stay, uh, giving some children an opportunity to get a good education uh, and all the things that come along with that. Uh, you know, because, you know, one of the things that, that I think most people don't think about and, you know, I, the minimum wage issue is coming back up, as as you alluded to earlier. So I'm now getting all of these people who are going, well, you know, when I was a kid, you know, I got a minimum wage job and it taught me hard work and taught me, you know, mm -hmm. you, you stick to itiveness and showing up on time. And, you know, all of these these things that they now think are are wonderful about themselves. And then they were able to go on, go to college and lead really great lives. And I'm mm -hmm. going, but here's the thing. You were able to do that as a stepping stone. This is these folks' lives. That minimum wage that was extra, a little bit of extra money so you could go out on the weekends that you just kind of ticked away, this is what they have to survive on. And if we don't make work pay for those people, why would, you know, honestly, I wouldn't work for minimum wage. I'd figure out anything else to do. 
Yeah, you know, we know that the fast food industry is employing more and more women in their 30s. So in other words, moms. And, you know, the idea that a weekend job is so Skip and Muffy can go to the movies, that's a pretty privileged way of looking at the world. Yep. Um, when I was in high school, my job helped put food on the table. That's true for a lot of people. Um, and is actually keeps a lot of kids from attending school quite as much as they should. Um, it, the biggest educational problem for children in poverty is attendance. They miss a ton of school because they have adult responsibilities or they get sick more often because their asthma isn't managed or they don't have a winter coat. Um, you know, the, this idol of childhood that we have, it's not true for everybody. No, you're right. You, you hit the asthma thing. I had horrible asthma as a kid. Uh, and it, it turns out now that I look back on it, uh, we mm -hmm. were we were right in the line. I, you know, I lived in Cleveland uh, when the air when the airplanes would fly into Cleveland Hopkins Airport. We were literally mm -hmm. right under the runway. Uh, so there was that. There was the pollution. There was also uh, my, you know, the places were infected with bugs, and my mother would spray bug spray, and that just caused horrible asthma for me. So that's just another memory. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, I want to get to two more things. Um, mm -hmm. You talk a little bit about UBI, universal basic income. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have my conservative friends who are losing their minds going, you just want to give people free money to lay around and do nothing. And I have to remind them that it, this isn't a hippie liberal idea. This was actually an idea that Milton Friedman came out with in the 60s, uh, something called a negative tax, which eventually turned into Reagan signing the earned income tax credit. So this doesn't have hippie liberal roots uh this is actually the business community saying hey we need consumers right exactly um and the biggest american experiment in ubi was under the nixon administration and it was run by a young dick cheney and donald rumsfeld um nixon very nearly made that policy it's it's not a crazy idea as i said earlier you know 40 percent of us can't make our basic needs. So you've got a consumer society where people can't afford to consume. You know, even evil old Henry Ford wanted to make sure that all of his workers could afford to buy his cars. We can't continue to separate all the money out in this society into a very, very privileged, small, small group on top. And more and more of us at the bottom just saying, hey, I can't get by. No. Like that won't work. It simply won't work. No, and this is where it brings me to my last point. You know, you, you talk about voting in the book and uh, how important voting is uh, because, you know, if we're going to change anything, it's going to be getting, you know, some of these people that have been way too long into elected office who have been holding up any progress, any ability to get Medicare for all or or some decent uh, cradle to grave kind of health care. We can call it whatever you need to or to strengthen labor laws or uh, raise the minimum wage. It's been over 12. It's 12 years now since the yeah. last time the minimum wage was increased, uh, which is just, you know, just horrible. Uh, but it comes down to voting. Rich people vote at a much higher rate than poor people. How do we get poor people to vote? Well, for one thing, we can take down barriers. Um, and I know a lot of people who are working on that right now. We need to work on that not two weeks before the election, but all the way through. You know, any barrier that makes it harder to vote is going to weigh more heavily on poor people because they can't afford to lose the paid time to stand in long lines, et cetera. Um, you know, we're the only country where registration isn't automatic, where, you know, if we really wanted people to vote, would we do it during working hours on a Tuesday? It's crazy. We really need to open up the elections and we need to find a way around Citizens United so that politicians are not speaking to the highest bidder. Even I would say folks that I consider fairly on the up and up in Congress realize that they have to spend an awful lot of their time talking to rich people. Yep. They spend more time fundraising than they spend legislating. Absolutely. I have a friend. These races a, are ridiculously expensive. It's crazy. I have a friend who was, who, who was a congressman who, who said, look, you know, I, uh, no one ever bought my vote, uh, but it bought me it bought you 15 minutes of my year. And that's incredibly valuable. I mean, we all activists like me, we fight for that like crazy. 
Yeah. Again, the book Broke in America, Seeing, Understanding and Ending U.S. Poverty, written by Joan Samuel Goldblum and Colleen Sadix. Uh, we'll make sure we get links out on how you can get, pick up this book. Highly suggested. Colleen, I appreciate you taking time for us. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Rick. Good stuff. Thanks so much. Love to hear your thoughts. You can email me, rick at thericksmithshow.com. Going to take a quick break right back after this. Stick around. Saving work in America, one show at a time. The Rick Smith Show. 